Okay, well, it's very nice to have you back on the show. It's been quite some time, actually. It has. It's so nice to be back. I definitely follow your journeys on social media and I'm always interested in the things that uh, you have to say about the various topics. My students love your podcast. I'm always learning from the conversations that you have. So it's an honor actually to be back here. Also, like, it's funny how some things change and some things don't. I think last time we talked about agencies and family reunification and still such a big issue, right? No, they've all been resolved. Everything's (laughs) smooth and uh, all families that want to reunite are in Canada. (laughs) If if only only they put us out of business, right? (laughs) Yeah. And then a couple of years after this episode about statelessness, that will be resolved. Yes. So (laughs) so it all starts with your podcast. (laughs) Definitely. I think that what is actually, it was interesting, I mean, we want to talk about your your new book, but it feels kind of timely in a way, because we've been talking about notions of sovereignty in a number of different podcasts, just because, um, you know, it's something that we talked about in the episode where we were talking about Gaza and the conflict, and um, it's just something that has been top of mind for me. I've been doing a lot of work um, in presentations and just conversations about um, intersections between Indigenous law and Indigenous rights and and immigration and that sort of thing. So um, I was really fascinated by um, the fact that you've written this book about the notion of statelessness and what does it mean and and how is it impacting people? Because I do think it's a pretty uh, under... I mean, you, you've, you said that it was something that's covered quite a lot, but I, I mean, maybe it's just the first, for me, the first... Um, body of work that I've I've uh, read um, on the subject so it was very interesting to me yeah I'm glad you say that because I do think it is an emerging area that um, you know even some of the key cases that went before the Supreme Court in the last um, five years I would say some of the applicants were stateless and yet that was such a little played up fact it wasn't played up as much as I would have expected or I would have wanted to if uh, I was involved but I think it's a really interesting concept because we do confront it and I'm sure both of you have seen it in your own work um, occasionally Um, and just uh, for for listeners who might not know I just want to start at the beginning and the term stateless really means a person who doesn't have citizenship to any country whatsoever so they um, they might have temporary or permanent residence somewhere, but ultimately what it means is that they don't have a home legally in terms of their citizenship. And so there, um, uh, there's a lot of repercussions as a result of that, that you might not be able to access certain kinds of uh, services such as education, healthcare, um, and you might be marginalized as a result because you are constantly trying to resolve your immigration status and you might not have immigration status in, in certain periods of your life as a result, which might lead to complications with, with you know, simple things like getting a cell phone or a bank account, depending on where you are. Yeah, so there's a, and as you mentioned in your book, there's a difference between being stateless and being without status in a country. So do you want to go over some of the ways that people can find themselves without having citizenship anywhere? Yeah, so different countries have different laws with regards to who is eligible to get citizenship. And in Canada, we're quite lucky because we do have birthright citizenship in the sense that anybody born within Canada's borders uh, automatically gets citizenship. Not every country has this same approach. And so you find some countries have approaches where you either obtain citizenship through a parental link. Canada does that as well. Um, but that might be the main mode of uh, acquiring citizenship. Others, you know, long-term residence and other criteria. Um, most countries offer a route of naturalization, which requires people to pass certain tests like language tests and knowledge tests. We do that too in Canada. Um, and other kinds of criteria, such as a certain period of time of residence. So, um, you know, you could see all kinds of different rubrics in terms of the ways in which people get citizenship. But because there's different ways in which countries confer citizenship, a lot of people fall through the cracks. Um, And so I, you know, kind of interrogate, um, you know, what, you know, what are the moves behind certain uh, legal frameworks 
that justify when citizenship is conferred. And so it's an, it's it's interesting because I think a lot of people take for granted, especially in Canada, because we have birthright citizenship, that people must be citizens somewhere. Um, but that's not always the case. Go for it, Deanna. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I was um I was fascinated in 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 the way that you um, describe that um, in many countries, um, Canada included, um, one of the challenges becomes that in order to establish that you are stateless, you have to um, overcome the hurdle of demonstrating that you're not entitled to citizenship in the place where you might have been born or in the place and, and the complexities around that. And that's how I've sometimes come across cases involving statelessness, where to me, it seems like somebody is de facto stateless. However, um, you know, the, the onus of proving that they would not actually get the recognition of citizenship in their country of birth um, can be very, very challenging. And um, I'm just, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I, you know, I thought it was good how you how you laid that out uh, very much and the challenges that people face um, in those circumstances. Yeah, thanks for pointing that out. I think that's one of the most, um, uh, I would say, disturbing uh, findings from my research as a legal scholar, and you as lawyers will appreciate this, that, you know, we're always held to different burdens and standards of proof when we're presenting evidence um, before an, either administrative tribunals or courts, um, and they're quite strict, you know, even in an administrative setting, we have to follow rules of evidence. Um, yet what we find is that in cases where uh, stateless persons are, are involved, in some cases, there's very little to no evidence. And in fact, fact finders are making speculative findings based on a tangential link that someone might have to a foreign country to make a legal finding that they are essentially a citizen of a different country. Um, so I'll give an example, that one that many of you and your listeners might be familiar with. So someone might be you know, putting forth a refugee claim, and they might be stateless, but they might have spent some time in a previous country, or they might have a parent who has citizenship to another country. And that link, either residents or a parent who has citizenship to another country, might suffice for a legal fact finder to say, well, you are technically stateless, we're not going to acknowledge that, but we think that you're a citizen of this country because you potentially could obtain citizenship in that country via your mother, via the fact that you had residence in this place and you, um, you know, could pursue things um, at that location. And to me, that's really troubling because first, you know, as many of us know, the administrative legal process is never um, a guarantee that once you engage with it through an application process, the outcome is very, um, you know, we just don't know what a decision maker will decide. And, and citizenship applications are like that. And my research shows that even though on its face, somebody might be entitled to citizenship, they might not actually acquire it, even though they um, tick all the boxes. The other thing is that there's this weird move um, that's happening in, in legal discourse about the fact that um, people can be seen as citizens of other places and requiring this preliminary due diligence on the part of stateless persons to exhaust all their remedies, so to speak, when, you know, there isn't such a requirement in international law, you know, and I think it's become a legal trend whereby decision makers are requiring this kind of exhaustion. But if you think about it on a practical level, it requires a person to approach 260 odd countries to verify that they can't get citizenship elsewhere. And in cases where even they have tried to obtain confirmation, that still doesn't satisfy the court. And I'm thinking of the very famous case of Abu Qadi, where um, his parents were you know, the, the facts and dispute in that case were whether or not his parents were working for the Indian consulate at the time. Um, the court ultimately found that they were, but India throughout the proceedings uh, kept saying that they, um, Budlakadi was not a citizen of India. And despite that, Canada still deemed um, him a citizen of in India. So I think it's, for us as lawyers, I think we should be very concerned about the very um, thin 
evidence, if at all. And I, I would say there's no evidence. It's a more speculative findings about mm -hmm. where people should be um, considered from and what kind of citizenship they have. And I think it's the, the, con the confirmation through legal documentation that really should stand at the end of the day in, in certain legal proceedings. Yeah, this challenge exists whenever the onus is on an applicant to prove a negative, I find. And mm -hmm. so um, the onus of trying to establish that you are not a citizen of a place is, um, or any other situation, there are numerous other ones so that I could come up with, um, are, are challenging. We've been talking um, the last episode, we were talking about proving that you are not going to be a spy in the future. This is another <laughs> one of these things um, which yeah. has become a preoccupation of us. But, um, you know, these proving negatives are, are, are very challenging. And I think the other part that, um, that you go into um, at some length is that, um, you know, the, the best that an applicant can generally or a claimant can generally do is to establish that, that the process of adjudicating or deciding those citizenship processes, that they're not neutral. Um, oftentimes it's like, well, it's because the registration is slow. And I really appreciated the remark that you said that like, these are sometimes chalked up to administrative matters that registration of citizens has failed, but that doesn't mean that you're not entitled to that citizenship. And just kind of um, piercing the veil about the neutrality of that registration process that often these are not neutral factors, but rather things that are um, because of systemic, um, you know, bias or racism or whatever the case may be. And so um, statelessness is not done by way of an accident, that it can be a concerted um, decision that is actually made for the mm -hmm. registration not to occur. Yeah, I think it's a challenge because for many of us in immigration law, we have confronted the administrative legal system quite uh, aggressively, I would say, right? That is our bread and butter. Um, but I think for a lot of people, they take for granted that they would go to a government counter and expect, you know, certain kinds of service and expect certain forms to be given to them, that they will be treated with respect, that they will, um, that the information they give will be taken for granted and things will process as expected. But this is not always the case for people who are stateless. And sometimes they are gaslit about who they actually are, um, where they actually come from, um, and the potential uh, links that they have. So, you know, family, community, employment, all these things are questioned. And in an administrative context, which is not, you know, increasingly the court's always calling for more deference to the things that are happening there. There's some really troubling things happening in these venues um, to people who might not be as savvy as legal practitioners. And so, you have things in my research where we you see people being denied proper forms, being told erroneous information, given bad advice, and sometimes being outright denied um, based on really extraneous or frivolous reasons. I've also witnessed uh, the government counters in some of these places where some people were told, okay, you brought your marriage certificate, now you need to bring uh, another documentation to show um, you know, uh, that the marriage occurred at that place and you need verification from that embassy or whatever. So there's always added requirements in different places and things like that. It's very confusing for people who don't have legal counsel or support. Um, you know, it might be a little bit different in Canada, but I think in Canada as well, we've seen, you know, forms get changed all the time. Information is, new information is required. I think even just the new special program for Gazans, you know, we there's new things in that form that some of us have never seen before. So this happens all the time, you know, and I think as lawyers, we, we should put the governments um, on notice that we're, we're watching and we're concerned about, about the thing, the moves that they make and what does it mean? What do these moves mean? So yeah, Deanna, I really appreciate your comment about how, you know, my research is really about not just the legal barriers, but what, what is the meaning behind the requirements, the moves that um, the administrative process requires. Um, what what kinds of things do they say about our society, about who we value as persons, who are we welcoming, um, and and uh, what kinds of things that law is shielding or hiding? Yeah, and I think it, it also 
highlights the disparity between if you're able to afford counsel or not and your ability mm -hmm. to get these documents. Um, you can see cases, say, one example that we've seen where the government is alleging that um, someone from China who's a Canadian citizen would easily be able to obtain Chinese citizenship. And that person is saying, well, no, if I if you take away my Canadian citizenship, I'll be stateless. And this dispute arises over just how easy is it to get Chinese citizenship? Mm -hmm. And if you're able to connect with like a lawyer or anyone who can just find a someone in China to give a legal opinion, that person will be a, a huge advantage over someone who doesn't have those resources, um, which can then lead to just very unfortunate results. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're right because, um, you know, it, the, the word of the applicant is no longer given as much weight, you know, in, in terms of their knowledge of their own ad administrative hassle of trying to obtain certain kinds of status and things. I, I, I also see this in cases where people might not have citizenship as well, or might not um, have the opportunity to get citizenship, but the fact that they've had temporary status elsewhere is also a factor. And it kind of adds a veneer to their application to say, well, why don't you pursue long-term, you know, um, avenues in X country that you were working in temporarily. So, you know, there's this move beyond citizenship that if you even have immigration status elsewhere, could you be deemed, you know, could that be seen as a, an avenue for you? And it kind of takes away, um, you know, away from the actual examination of the merits of the case, right? We never get to the question of, are you deserving of refugee protection? Because we're kind of distracted by this notion that you're a foreigner that actually belongs elsewhere, right? And so I think that's quite troubling in, in many respects, especially as Canada contemplates the kinds of protection we want to offer to people and who we want to do that for. Mm -hmm. And there's also just the issue of the, the barriers that exist from the outset because the person needs to be outside of their country of yes. citizenship in order to make a claim. Um, what does that mean for a person who is stateless? How do they travel when they don't have any identity documents? And so already um, there are numerous obstacles standing in the way of that person accessing the, the refugee scheme um, in general. Yeah, agreed. I think it's, um... It, it makes um, it curious about the fact that statelessness is a very distinct issue facing people. Um, and I think, you know, some people might think, oh, well, why can't they just obtain refugee protection? Well, if the, the technical act of being stateless is not a ground for protection under refugee law, right? So a lot of stateless people I know of actually, including my father, they my father immigrated to Canada as an economic migrant, you know, and I think you know, for a lot of stateless people, they don't quite have the, uh, and this, is, this might sound really crass as a lawyer, but they don't have the facts to plug into um, the refugee definition. And so, you know, Canada has really, I think, um, been lackluster in its approach to um, providing any kind of resolution to the issue of statelessness. And I think there's this kind of um, fear of the floodgates, you know, the common problem of like, well, if we address it for a certain group of people, will this be, you know, an, a floodgate issue? But I think, you know, in my research, as I'm moving through the Canadian context, there are pockets of people. It's, it's very predictable to figure out who's stateless and what kinds of cases come to Canada. I'm thinking, you know, during the time when Jason Kenney was uh, Minister of Immigration, there was a lot of public rhetoric about Koreans and how North Koreans are actually South Koreans. And I look in my research right now about um, the moves that governments make in terms of conferring ghost citizenship, like conferring South Korean citizenship on people who um, we're not really sure if they will actually get it. And then another group of people, my research is Palestinians, you know, they are often stateless and come to Canada, but sometimes may not qualify for, in the past, they didn't, a lot of them didn't qualify for refugee protection. Another group um, includes people who kind of are, you know, targeted through inadmissibility and then find themselves stateless after not realizing that they 
you know, either as children or through the immigration process did not complete the step of getting citizenship. And so there's a, a lot of people that fall through the cracks because our legal categories and criteria simply don't address statelessness very well. And perhaps also children born as people who are living without status. And I mean, if it's if they're born in a country that confers citizenship um, based on, um, you know, birth on that soil, but if if it is not such a country that they are born into, then the question of their citizenship also is um, is totally ambiguous. Yeah, and I guess I would say too is that a significant portion of the world's statelessness population are children, right? So, right from the get go, you know, many people are living with the status, and um, you know, unless they have a parent or a guardian that is willing to navigate all of the legal loopholes to try to resolve it, they're really, um, you know, they, they belong to a, a very vulnerable population who might um, suffer from a lot of health and social consequences. Well, I think you mentioned in your book that a lot, or maybe the largest category of stateless people in Malaysia are just people who can't get the documents to prove yeah. that they are Malaysian, even yeah. though under law, they likely are proving it uh, renders them de facto stateless. Yeah. And I just think about, you know, when I was practicing full-time, I remember, you know, tasking clients being like, okay, here's a list of documents I need from you. Right. And that's such a daunting activity to just acquire documentation for some people. Um, this is, you know, compounded in statelessness circumstances where you have, um, places who don't keep records. They might not, you know, what if the person was not born in a hospital, the kinds of rules associated with um, uh, confirming that your birth occurred in, on Malaysian soil requires something as ridiculous as four witnesses. And what if only a midwife was present during your birth, you know? Um, so these kinds of barriers are extra, I would say, outside of just the labor of obtaining documentation, right? Um, going to the offices, there's fees associated with getting documents, as we all know. Um, and then translating them if they're not in the correct language for the official. Um, all of these steps are seem monumental, especially for people who are of a working class background, if they're working shifts or whatnot and can't get to a registrar or government office during open open hours to obtain like proof. All of these things really compound, uh, I think, the experience of why people sometimes um, simply um, can't meet you know, some of the basic requirements, right, that are, um, and then it's frustrating when you get to government office and say, that's not enough, actually, now we also need this. And then they're being told that after they've been given an initial list of things to do. So it's it's a very disheartening process for some people to go through. You you made clear in your book that, um, that this research project was motivated both by personal and by kind of overarching like legal and political um, drivers. Uh, maybe you can tell us just a little bit about what led you to this piece of work. Yeah, I, you know, I'm very lucky in the sense that I have a job that, you know, uh, allows me to research on things that I'm passionate about. And I was lucky enough to have a sabbatical in 2018. Uh, and I really wanted to go back to where my parents had come from and was really fascinated with my father's own personal history of being a stateless person himself. Um, you know, and I always had thought that it was an unusual thing growing up. But then as I was practicing immigration law, I encountered more and more stateless persons and read more about their cases. And I wanted to understand how is it possible that statelessness still exists today? Um, so I went back and there's a huge advocacy um, environment in Malaysia of lawyers and advocates on stateless issues there. And um, I really learned a lot from them, but also was able to, you know, dive deep into having, you know, conversations with stateless people about what it felt like to be stateless, what they experienced through the administrative and legal process. Um, and then coming home to Canada and realizing that it's not so different here, that the experience of stateless persons in post-British colonial states are very similar because of the inherited laws that we acquired through um, the British Empire. And so it's been fascinating to see that uh, statelessness is a product of colonization, 
you know, as we talk about decolonial approaches to immigration law, I would say this is one area where more attention has to be paid about um, the roots of citizenship law, how they come from British hierarchical racialized notions of um, categorizing people um, and how that's really informed our laws. Um, in Malaysia, citizenship laws are embedded in its constitution. In Canada, we have our own citizenship act, but the practices, rationales and purposes behind the citizenship law is very similar. And the ways in which the judiciary is picking up, um, you know, the way the approaches of legal findings about what citizenship a person has, as we spoke about earlier, is identical in a lot of different contexts. And so it was fascinating for me to see how this is being reproduced and, and the roots of it, that it really stems from those nascent times of creating independent countries out of British colonization, but that really just um, ensconcing like ideas of um, citizenship through that colon colonial lens. Um, this part of the conversation reminds me a fair bit of a conversation that Steve and I had several months ago uh, with another academic, Simon Wallace, where we were talking about the history of deportation law in Canada and how it was sort of at some point Canada sort of conferred on itself this right to not just um, just it, it sort of created these statutory powers where it said now we have the right to expel those that are not that are not entitled to be here on this on this and so he went on the same sort of a historical deep dive about when did this begin? Where were the origins? And again, came up with some of the same conclusions that you did, that it goes back to these very basic notions of sovereignty where, um, you know, these are things that we take for granted, that they're part of our basic understanding of what nationhood means, that there are some who belong and that exist and are allowed to remain and be at liberty to do what they want. And there are those who are considered outsiders and that once you set it up in this way that there are those who fall through the cracks and so um, but it's the same sort of ideology um, and many of the same roots yeah i i would say a lot of the infrastructure and the ways in which we designed as you say sovereign borders and sovereign mechanisms to manage um, the movement of people and communities it's really astonishing how the same tools that were used during time when Canada was a, a colony are, are are being replicated in different ways today and just given different names. You know, We actually haven't been very innovative in the ways. I mean, I guess the point system is innovative, but it's in, in a sense, it's a, it's, it's a different replication of the kinds of ways in which we um, reinforce notions about um, what we value and who we value and who, you know, what constitutes um, someone who's um, deserving of citizenship, right? And it reinforces notions of um, the fact that there are people who are always going to be other. And, you know, I guess I would say, you know, the fact that Canada hasn't paid a lot of attention to resolving statelessness is um, probably in part due to the uh, license that, they in, in the moves that they make in terms of refugee protection, you know, that they have a very generous refugee resettlement program, um, that we have a, you know, a pretty well-established refugee determination system. And this allows us to kind of ignore, you know, other groups of people who might not um, fit into those um, acceptable, I guess, ways in which Canada um, provides um, safe haven to people. You want to discuss, you got into your book, like going back to what uh, Simon had said on the previous episode, he talked about how when it came to Canada's first deportation, there was a discussion about would this fall under sovereign prerogative or mm -hmm. something done through legislation and something that then with legislation builds into rights and how if a different decision had been made you know, back in when the first deportation at the turn of the 20th century, that it was sovereign privilege and couldn't really be challenged in courts, how different everything would be today. You talk in uh, your book about um, sovereign privilege versus a rights-based approach, mm -hmm. viewing um, statelessness in this context. Do you want to go into a bit about that distinction? 
Yeah, thanks for asking that question. I remember back when Donald Galloway and I were writing um, our, our Irwin Law Text and we were like diving deep into that single case that's been you know, quoted over and over again in Immigration Law in Canada about how the state has um, the right to deny anybody access or authorization to enter Canada and that nobody has a right to enter Canada, as, you know, and we, we were perplexed as to where this came from. And it really just came out of thin air there, you know, it, it might have come from like an old English case, um, but it, it was it was just an empty pronouncement that really had no legal tie to anything. Um, and if you look at the Magna Carta and other older texts, you know, yes, there was an idea that the sovereign took care of people and within its borders and they describe people as vessels and chattels and blah, blah, blah. But there was never an idea that the sovereign could outright deny people entry within a territory and that it was seen as, um, you know, movement of people seen as a necessary conduit of society and, and the economy. And so this notion that um, the state has that prerogative to say no at its will for any reason whatsoever is kind of a make-believe power, you know? Um, and so I think, you know, the struggle I had in that book was that, A, there's this very strong prerogative state power that has been replicated over and over and over again in jurisprudence and in the interpretation of our immigration laws. And, you know, the ways that lawyers have tried to confront this is by uh, through a rights regime. And yet, you know, my argument there is that human rights always fall short because the right of the state is always going to trump that, you know, and the state's always pushed back on the notion that, yes, there are human rights. And yes, to some extent, we're going to look at that person's individual rights. But ultimately, what is given more weight is this sovereign prerogative that we can say yes or no on any reason whatsoever. And I mean any reason because um, the state is unabashedly about um, discretion has said, you know, um, authorization to enter Canada is ultimately at the discretion and at the whim of, of the state. And so it's a very powerful power that has been unquestioned for a lot for for many Canadians and taken for granted and all, often picked up in public discourse to say, you know, people are coming in illegally. You know, this gives license to this notion of mm -hmm. how people are moving and and making them illegal when you know if you trace those kinds of notions in law it has become so you know quote unquote illegal only by you know a, a single pronouncement made by one judge a very 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 long time ago which is kind mm -hmm. of you know maybe that's the way law is made in our common law system but I think we should question it more in terms of you know what kind of society do we want to live in and why do we give so much power to the sovereign um, with with very little um, accountability in, in this regard and the ways in which the immigration um, legal community have been pushing back have been, it's, it's, it's a struggle, you know? And if you look at charter litigation and whatnot, the sovereign prerogative always seems to um, infiltrate, if not, um, you know, outwardly, it certainly permeates the thinking you know, I, I think Justice Rowe said in like a couple of decisions in the last couple of years that, you know, reiterating that notion that there is no right to to enter Canada. Right. And I think, you know, that says a lot about I think we should interrogate the the, the roots of that a little bit more. And similar to what your previous podcast interviewees have interrogated, where is this coming from and how and why we have re reproduced this in the various ways we have. Yeah, it's very interesting. Like I've been doing research on the origins of the Chinese head tax and why that was originally brought in instead of, because one of the questions I was asking was, well, why a tax instead of just banning them? And back in the 1880s, that just wasn't viewed as a thing, right? Like it was, oh, well, we can't, we can't ban people from entering. Anybody would have the ability to enter Canada, but we can tax. And mm -hmm. the even notion of outright just this person can or cannot enter the country, um, mm -hmm. There was and yet, brief then, discussion on it because British Columbia was lobbying for it. But at the federal mm -hmm. government, they were like, but that's not how we control borders. And that's not how borders work. That's but fascinating. Then subsequently, there was apologies around the discriminatory nature of the head tax. And yet 
we've recoiled in the other direction. And there seems at this moment to be no real shame associated with saying, no, 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 we can just prohibit. <laughs> and yeah. so, uh, and so um, this is precisely why we wanted to have you on the program is because this is, I think, something that there's been a lot of tension around and a lot of people doing inquiry, but to bring some life to an intelligent, academic, informed conversation about, I know this is how it is. I know this <laughs> is how we've all accepted it to be, but can we look at this again one more time and be like, you know, and it's not just that this is how we have established that this is the authority, but we have actually made it virtually impossible mm -hmm. for those borders to be penetrated. It's all about fortifications and about making it impossible for our refugee claimants to even approach our borders and setting quotas and, you know, the, the supposed generosity of our refugee system and all of this sort of thing where it's, um, this is all built on this notion of statehood that I don't think is being fundamentally questioned at, mm -hmm. at, at a deep level. It's just, it's just about putting into place these mechanisms that make the goal of arrival virtually out of reach and then um, just going through the motions of enforcing and further entrenching these systems that exist here without going back to a first principle conversation about, okay, this went in there at this time. It wasn't there before, it's there now. Are we all okay with this? Um, mm -hmm. And I just really like how your book breathes life into that at a very like engaged, but professional uh, academic level. Um, it's sort of, I've been saying on the last few shows that I feel like I'm going through all of the practice of law with this very childlike attitude going but why but why and yes. um, just feeling like it feels very naive but at the same time when you come at it from the perspective of a researched academic um, perspective and say well it wasn't always like this this is something that mm -hmm. at some point we decided on and we've now all settled and are we okay with the consequences mm -hmm. yeah and ultimately you know we you know, I think a lot of people try to view the law as a, appearing to be neutral. But, you know, ultimately, as you said earlier, we we really can't assume that there are they are neutral and that they're applying equally to everyone. You know, and and certainly I think, you know, what's been interesting is that recent litigation that's been going through the courts in Canada, we see this kind of um, defense of that right of that state prerogative. And this is this kind of heavy hammer on the the ways in which um, different decisions the government has made is 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 justified under that. Um, but I, you know, Stephen, I'd love to hear more about what you found in terms of like the justification for that <laughs> mode, because I think you know, even though it wasn't an outright ban, it did effectively act like one, right? And in some ways, and it's it's being replicated in different ways with quotas and. It's yeah, just I mean, it wasn't it wasn't very effective, which is why they eventually did just switch to an outright ban. Mm -hmm. um, then I'm, I can do a whole separate. I mean, eventually I plan on doing like a whole episode on the Chinese head tax, um, mm -hmm. and the, how it led from building a railroad to head tax to ban. But uh, it is just like it's it's watching. And it's part of why I find history fascinating is like seeing how we get to where we are and also how complex like the unintended consequences of complicated legislation which is another thing that yeah Yana and I have been discussing on several episodes lately how you don't hear the politicians kind of opining on what they think of the consequences of some of their actions so going to the you mentioned the Budlakti decision earlier about the person who couldn't be a citizen of Canada because he may have had a claim to Indian citizenship that the courts ruled he hadn't fully exhausted. At the time um, that that decision came down, the Harper government was trying to introduce its bills that would strip uh, citizenship of what they call dual citizens who mm -hmm. were convicted of certain serious offenses. And in the media, it was always portrayed as dual citizens. The Politicians always referred to it as dual citizens, which created this impression of like, well, they're people who choose to be citizens of two countries, like, you know, tough on them for having chose that. Whereas the actual legislation was people who wouldn't be rendered stateless. 
And yes. I remember uh, Robin Seligman was on the podcast a few episodes. She was arguing before a committee, I think the Senate committee, that a consequence of that could be, well, what about all Jews in Canada who arguably, you know, at first glance, someone who didn't know the ins and outs of Israeli citizenship law could say, well, they could always become citizens in Israel. Right. And I remember her making that argument. It's not, um, you know, it's it, it in the context of how certain other laws are developing, it wouldn't be that unforeseeable that a bureaucrat would make the determination. The court would say, well, based on the evidence before the officer, it's reasonable for the officer to have concluded that this person could have been Israeli, and then the law just takes off. It definitely a, uh, could direction. happen. Yeah. That's an excellent example. I think it definitely could happen. That and and there, I mean, they could. There's a lot of case law they could pull on for examples and yeah. and say it's been done before. We find we can make this legal finding. This person's actually eligible for Israeli citizenship, and therefore we can go ahead and strip their citizenship here. Yeah. <laughs> like I, and then I ultimately, can for those see who it. don't know, the law was I think. I don't remember if it was struck down in court. I think the liberals just amended the act to get rid of it. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah, it's it's, but it's frightening that that even was tabled in in, in public discussion or in even in parliamentary discussion. Right, that it really thins the idea of citizenship, um, and it's frightening because citizenship is, um, you know, really opens the door to a lot of things that people need in their lives, you know, yeah. like basic necessities. The other one recently um, was the striking down of the restriction on citizenship of dissent. Um, yeah. It's just like in that one, as Canadians start, I was always wondering like if IRCC treated Canadian citizens, if Canadian citizens got to experience what it's like to be uh, an immigrant struggling to get documents, would mm -hmm. they like, you know, take to the streets and during COVID, there were the passport delays, which yes, like verbally seemed to rise to this level oh. of national crisis. But it, I don't know. I thought we actually like. I was surprised that people did put up with it. So I'm not yeah. as convinced that as I used to be that if Canadians would only experience it, they'd rise up. But... Well, I did. You know, I did find it interesting during COVID when people were separated from their families because of the border mm -hmm. closures, and they were you know, up in arms about being separated from their families. And I was like, this is, this is yeah. not new. <laughs> like they acted like this was a new thing that was happening in Canada. And oh my gosh, what, what is Canada? Why is the state interfering with my, my, you know, reunification with my family? And I'm like, it's always done that. It's just never applied to you. <laughs> right. Yep. So it's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. And the number of situations in which people just have no ability to to obtain the documents that they require. Like we're not just talking about situations of inconvenience, but there is like an actual barrier to being able to obtain proof of citizenship in the country of citizenship or where, um, you know, there's actually danger associated with trying mm -hmm. to obtain recognition of citizenship because of ethnicity or, or some other factor. Um, you know, uh, these issues are quite routine in the, in the, in the refugee sector and so um, I think um, you know they can sometimes when you when you speak of them as just entitlement to citizenship to talk about those as dry facts as if they're neutral um, does become extremely problematic for sure and you know I think it's interesting because statelessness I think is a issue that should be watched because as we kind of watch around the world where stateless populations are growing you know, they, they're kind of uh, the canary in the coal mine. So I'm thinking about the Rohingya in Burma, you know, and how, you know, that is an example where statelessness, the stripping of citizenship is used as a tool of oppression. You know, I'm thinking about uh, in Assam, India, where, you know, millions of Muslim have been stripped of citizenship. They're, again, an, a kind of move against a certain ethnic religious group. And, um a sign that of uh, troubling oppression that's happening in that part of the world, you know? So I think, you know, where we see issues of statelessness arising, like we as immigration lawyers can see the tide coming when people claiming refugee protection, but, um, you know, Canada, I think should be taking a more active role in monitoring these situations and then acting as we have in the past as uh, international spokesperson or, 
around these issues. And I think Canada has been very absent on that, which has been disappointing for me as a scholar that's watching this issue unfold before our eyes. Yeah, it feels like it's, uh, well, there's just been a few global conflicts that have totally preoccupied the I don't even know, do we have a pro, has there been a program for the Rohingya in Canada? I don't, I don't think, think so. so. No, uh, but I do, I have seen a couple of cases from other people, not myself, come through where they have been able to get refugee protection. But again, it's like, if they get here kind of thing, right? Um, and I mean, it is, you know, in, in both those cases, you know, I imagine there might be security concerns because they are, you know, they some of them might be Muslim and things like that. So I'm not sure in terms of how, mm -hmm. what kinds of processes um, people have been navigating as a result of that, you know. I well, this year, I think we're supposed to take 5,000 Uyghurs this year. Um, they announced That's... or the House voted on it last year, two years ago. I have no idea if anything's coming from it. That would be interesting to see. Yeah. And I think that's an important program for sure. Those kinds of nods to the fact that these people are being oppressed um, makes a huge political statement, right? Uh, the mm -hmm. other area where you see statelessness a fair bit is all along the uh, Ukraine, Estonia, Latvia in terms yeah. of how their uh, Russian population, a lot of them are like de facto stateless. Um, and now coming the other way is Russia, you know, Ukrainians who came here and are stuck from, say, the Donbass or something, how that's all, and which is now under Russian control, how that will all be navigated. Mm -hmm. Some, Yeah, some of them have been forced to take Russian citizenship, which mm -hmm. is problematic. And then they lose too. their Ukrainian citizenship, I think. Yeah. I saw Estonia uh, for people who were forced to take Russian, yeah. Which is also, I think... Um, that that isn't you know something I've been toying with the idea of going researching later on is just um, this idea of forced citizenship you know because in law this is happening in many cases it's like you're actually Indian wow. citizen but in in yeah. Russia like they're actually forcing people to be deemed as Russian citizens and it actually has significant consequences for them right if you want your research to take a complete turn you can go interview some sovereign citizens who would say that they've been forced <laughs> to take Canadian citizenship and they yes don't want... that too <laughs> right that's a that whole too. other yeah yeah well there's you know indigenous communities that have their own passport system yeah. and and I that's I, I think an intriguing idea too because it is kind of um, a move against the state in the way that in which they've been managing and the movement of people and and ideas about you know um who who are legitimate communities within our borders right so oh that's a whole I think there was a Supreme Court decision today um today. on child care oh, the delivery the child of welfare. child welfare in uh, mm. which Quebec had challenged which is a similar like whose jur I mean it's we're getting a bit off topic but whose citizen whose jurisdiction do you fall under? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, but it it did give yeah that's that seems like a very positive decision for the indigenous community involved. So yeah, yeah, I haven't yeah. seen that one yet, but definitely this issue of citizenship in our own borders is still extremely complicated when it comes to indigenous communities because still the recognition for right to entry in the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act is still tied to registration in the Indian Act. And right. the thing that's, uh, you know, because Canada doesn't recognize the Jay Treaty as being a document that Canada is a party to. And so, um, so I mean, this is something that Canada has said it's going to take under study and consider and is doing a further round of consultations now. But even within our own domain, it's something that the question of, you know, right of entry and, um, and access and what, you know, what Indigenous communities can do um, you know, when they cross, when they cross the 49th parallel, what, you know, what rights uh, follow with them, um, mm -hmm. that still is completely unresolved, um, even when they have been conferred, um, when there's been recognition of, like, let's say, Nishka citizenship, and, and, you know, Nishka passports were issued, that then people started to encounter problems coming across the Canada border with those passports. So this is an entirely different episode as well. But I think that the idea that these these um, problems are only occurring elsewhere, I think, mm -hmm. in fact, 
um, this, these issues, these deep seminal issues about sovereignty and what does it mean and where are the limits, um, you know, they have, they, they have a lot of um, relevance and they, they need to be um, ascertained in a, in a more thorough way, even just in our own borders. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of um, invite um, people to think about it using Indigenous legal traditions too. like closer to the end of my book. I don't provide any answers about how to resolve this, but I think there's something to be said about the ideas of um, relationality, respect and um, in Indigenous legal traditions that can be informed through especially administrative legal encounters, right, and decision making. Um, and and having more compassion and realizing this person is part of the community and how do we want to interact with them in a respectful and compassionate way, right? Um, and and so I kind of you know very lightly invite people to think about that and to use you know a pluralistic legal lens to see what other communities view as a proper way to engage with visitors, you know, um, and, and especially those that are seeking help. But the other thing is I'm kind of pressed on the notion that people are visitors, you know, that some of these people have been deemed visitors, but they're really not. They're actually um, people within our community have longstanding links. And how do we want to, um, you know, welcome them back into the fold in a, um, you know, in a way that is um, principled um, and true to the tenets of what we try to aspire to in our laws, right? And some of these people have always said, I am a citizen. And one of the most beautiful things that I've discovered in my research is how stateless people, uh, the ones that I interacted with at least, were very resilient, but also steadfast in their identity. You know, in saying, I am a citizen. I don't want to apply through naturalization like the government counter is telling me to do. I want to be declared a citizen because it is important for me to be recognized as from this community, as of this community, and that I only have this one legal hurdle to overcome in terms of actually having identification, right? So those kinds of things, you know, up, you know, kind of pushing back on assumptions that people are foreign, that people don't already are part of our community, and also these notions of how do we want our legal system to operate in a principled um, manner with integrity, right? So, no, I think that's a a great point to end on. For sure, I think you said it beautifully. Thank well, thank you, and thank you for engaging with my research. It's um, you know, it's it, it's rewarding enough to engage with something you're passionate about, but to have people to converse with is a gift. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, you've done really valuable work here, and uh, you know, I, I I thank you for the effort and for for coming and talking to us about what you're working on. Thanks so much.